As you can see from what's on, written on the board, uh, the lesson is about the secret things belong to God. Now this is taken from uh, Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, where it says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, <clears throat> but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of the law. <clears throat> These secret things, <clears throat> unbelievers, once you say it's secret, they want to know what's the secret, and they go chasing after it. It's like telling a child, uh, no, don't put your finger in the socket, you're going to get hurt. And then they put their finger in and say, what do you mean don't put your finger in the socket? <laughs> so we're like that. That's the way human beings are, unfortunately. <clears throat> and uh, as a result of it, what we have is um, people delving into what they think are the secret things, but not in terms of asking God about them, uh, they're delving into it in the occult so that they can uh, talk to spirits that are either long dead or people who are long dead or evil spirits or the devil himself evil. They'd rather talk to that and to him than to talk to God, which is terribly unfor unfortunate. Now, when Israel were going back or were going uh, as they came out of uh, Egypt, uh, and out of the wilderness, and they were going into, uh, <clears throat> into the land of Canaan, uh, Israel was about to enter the land which God had given them, and Moses was warning them against the customs of these godless nations that they were going to be facing. Now, these godless nations have had centuries of their own way, their own selfishness, their own self-indulgence, their own desire to learn the secret things of God. They were well into the occult. So Moses had to warn them about it. So let's turn now to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Since you're in Deuteronomy, just go back to chapter 18. And we'll begin reading in verse 9. <clears throat> Moses says... When you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to imitate the detestable things of those nations. Now, these things were not detestable to the Canaanites. These were their customs. This is the way they lived. This is what they indulged themselves in. So when he says the detestable things of those nations, he's speaking about God's view of these things which these people practiced. And to him, they were detestable. And we need to understand that we must join with God in describing these things as detestable and in keeping away from these things. He says, There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, one who uses divination, one who practices witchcraft, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who casts a spell, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For whoever does these things is detestable to the Lord. And because of these detestable things, the Lord your God will drive them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. <clears throat> Now Israel was going to have a part <clears throat> in driving these Canaanites out. God had told them to go in there and to annihilate the Canaanites. Because if anybody was left, if anyone was left, they would influence them in terms of their worship, their gods, their idolatry, their immorality, and their occult practices. And he spells out the occult practices for them in these verses, which is very interesting indeed. Sorcerers, those who interpret omens, witch, witchcraft, uh, divination, uh, people who cast spells, mediums. Uh, all of these people <coughs> are involved in this practice. But these are detestable practices. Now, I, I'm emphasizing that because... <coughs> When you come up to the modern day, <clears throat> you, you don't feel that they are detestable. 
It's just, well, the mediums are human beings. They're like everybody else. They need to learn a living. And there's stupid people or enough pe stupid people to go to them and to play the game with them about what, what the dead say or what they don't say and, and, and what's over there when we die and so forth. So <clears throat> you really, and television really has made it possible for us to look at these people and think, they're, they're nice people, good looking, intelligent, nice people. Uh, and uh, so what? Big deal. Now, I do know we have to live in a world where there is evil and that we have to be kind to those who are evil. Uh, we must uh, act towards them as Jesus Christ would act towards them. We know what they're doing is wrong. We don't approve of their deeds, but we don't hate them. We hate what they're doing. We don't hate them. So this is a very fine line to walk, but we must walk it. And we must remember that uh, in, in the olden days now, they had a fair warning as to what these things were all about. And uh, the trouble was, you would think with that early warning given by Moses, that they would have taken it to heart. But they didn't. And they left Canaanites in the land and they use them for servants and so forth. But eventually, they start to intermarry with them. They start to look into their idolatry. They saw their immoral practices. They were very drawn to it. Uh, and so they caved in in so many ways to that influence. It's just not funny. Hundreds of years later, God has spoke again, again to Jeremiah. And, and if you would, would turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 23, beginning with verse 25. Jeremiah chapter 23. <clears throat> we'll begin with verse 25. I've heard what the prophets have said who prophesy falsely in my name, saying, I had a dream. I had a dream. How long? Is there anything in the hearts of the prophets who prophesy falsehood, even these prophets of the deception of their own heart, who intend to make my people forget my name by their dreams, which they relate to one another, just as their fathers forgot my name because of Baal? See, here's, here's false prophets. Now, false prophets are lumped in with diviners, uh, with mediums, with all the other people who are in the occult because they're serving the same master who is the devil and the evil spirits. And uh, for that reason, uh, what we're saying here about these false prophets or what God is saying about these false prophets is worth listening to. He says in verse 29 of this uh, chapter, is not my word like fire? Now they had something, God shows us something to compare what they're saying with what he's saying. And he says, is not my word like fire? Sure it is, declares the Lord. And like a hammer which shatters a rock, it, it has purpose, it has power, it has a means of changing things and altering things. The Word of God is so important that we should pay much greater attention to what that Word is saying than we do. We say we do, but how often do we take out the Bible? Do we take it out day by day? Do we think about it during the day? Do we look up passages? Do we ask ourselves questions? Do we reason about the Word of God? Is it that important to us? And if it's not, we should start making it important to us because it's our salvation. Not because it's there in the Bible, but because it's God's living word which brings life to all of us. It's the Holy Spirit's word and he's the life giver. So when we, when we read the word, we're listening to the words of the Holy Spirit. There's all sorts of talk in religious circles about 
the Holy Spirit spoke to me. The Holy Spirit spoke to me. I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit. We should start talking about the Holy Spirit spoke to me and start reading the passages and telling them, this is what he said to me. This is what, and I know this is true, and I know I can trust my life to what is said here because God cannot lie. In verse 31, Behold, I'm against the prophets, declares the Lord, who used their tongues and declared, The Lord declares. I said in last week's lesson, we had the, uh, this lesson last week, or, or a lead up to this lesson last week. I said, the one thing that these people have is uh, self-confidence. They have big personalities. They are able to uh, get their message across. They are able to do it in a, in a, in a, in a way that is uh, dynamic and interesting and entertaining. They're able to catch our imagination. They're able to push their agenda. They speak about their word like it's the word of God. And people love it. They love it. Give us more of this. This is what I, this is, I'm excited by this. I'm entertained by this. Give us what we, what we want. Oh, brethren, we need to grow up and stop being children. You're not here to be entertained. You're here to learn about God and his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. You're here to learn about salvation. You're here to learn about your responsibility towards God and his word. And we need to be happy that we're in a position that we're able to do that. In verse 31, Behold, I'm against the prophets, declares the Lord, who use their tongues and declare the Lord, declares. Behold, I'm against those who have prophesied false dreams, declares the Lord, and related them and led my people astray by their falsehoods and reckless boasting. Yet I did not send them or command them, nor do they furnish this people, watch this, nor do they furnish this people the slightest benefit. There is not the slightest benefit in what they have to say with their dreams, with their great boasting and pride. It's all a lie, a figment of their own imagination. Then the Lord said to me, that is to Jeremiah, the prophets are prophesying falsehood in my name. I've neither sent them nor commanded them nor spoken to them. They are prophesying to you a false vision. Listen, false prophets, divination. In other words, they're using the, the, the means of divination to get these images and, 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 uh, and these uh, false prophecies futility and deception of their own minds, he says. That's, that's all it is. It's futility and the deception of their own minds. Jeremiah 14, 14. Now you think we would have learned from that, all of that. No, we haven't learned. They hadn't even learned in New Testament times. The occult is a persistent problem in the world. It's as much a problem today as it was back in Moses' day or in Jeremiah's day. And it was certainly a problem for the Apostle Paul and Barnabas when they were on their first missionary journey. Let's turn to Acts chapter 13, 6 through 11. Acts chapter 13. <clears throat> when they, that is Paul and Barnabas, had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos. This is uh, the island of Cyp uh, Cyprus. Uh, it says, um, uh, let's see, where am I? I got myself lost here. Six again. Uh, when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a magician, a Jewish false prophet. Now listen to that, a Jewish false prophet. He had to have denied 
the faith of Judaism to become a false prophet. This man was an apostate from Judaism, from the living God. And he became a false prophet. And they were encountering him. And it says, whose name was Bar Jesus. Bar means son of. His father was called Jesus. Not our Lord, but it was, uh, Jesus was a name that was familiar and reasonably common back in that day and time. I think um, even in some parts of the world right now, uh, it's not unusual for Jesus to be used as a name. Um, whereas it's not Spain, Portugal. I think in Portugal there's quite a few people have Jesus uh, in, in their name. So the people from, Portug uh, from Portugal will tell you that. So, so it's, it was like that back then. Okay, let's read on, he says. Um, Who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. Well, it must have been very exciting for Paul and them to go to him and to, uh, especially for somebody who wants to hear it. But to Limas, the magician, for so his name is translated, was opposing them, seeking to turn the pro council away from the faith. Now, there's two things here. He was a false prophet. He was a magician. He was into the occult. So, again, the two have been brought together in this instance. And um, he was seeking to, uh, to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Very serious matter to do that. But Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him and said, You who are full of all deceit and fraud, didn't mince his words, you're full of deceit and fraud. You walked away from the truth of the Old Testament and from the God of the Old Testament. You walked right into error and lies and deception and all for your own selfish reasons. You're filled uh, with fraud and deceit. You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? That was because he was trying to turn a person away from the truth of the gospel. Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. He thought he was powerful. He thought nobody could challenge him. He thought he was bringing the light. And that he was doing this Sergius Paulus a favour by trying to denounce what Paul had to say about God and our Lord Jesus Christ and about salvation. But here the power of God is demonstrated through Paul and he's struck blind. And you might wonder why strike him blind? Because it was a symbol of the blindness of his spirituality which had been there for years. Although he says he was seeing, he was seeing nothing. He knew nothing. And he was only filled with deceit and lies. There's other forms of occult practices. A fortune teller is a person claiming to foretell one's future or destiny. There was a fortune teller in Philippi. And again, if we go to Acts chapter 16 now, beginning with verse 16, we can see the record of what happened there. In Philippi it happened, this is verse 16, that as we were going to a place of prayer, a slave girl having a spirit of divination it's the spirit of a python, uh, met us, who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune telling. Following after Paul and us, she kept crying out, saying, These men are bond servants of the Most High God, 
who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. Well, you think, well, she's telling the truth here, isn't she? And, uh, and everybody, she's letting everybody know what you really are. That's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Mm, obviously not. Why? Well, we'll see now in a minute. She continued doing this for many days. But Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of that at that, at that very moment. When, your master, when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged him into the marketplace before the authorities. And when they had brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, these men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews, and are proclaiming customs which are not lawful for us to accept or to observe in being Romans. They were right in a sense. These customs were going to be changed. Christianity changed them. Because Christianity is in opposition to these occult practices. And the whole point of this was that Paul did not want the people of Philippi to think that divination was associated with or supportive of Christianity. The gospel he was preaching. They have nothing to do with it. The Apostle Paul wanted the Gentile population to know that divination was opposed to Christianity. And it was. These customs were opposed to the customs that were being brought by Paul as he preached the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. By casting out the familiar spirit with a word, Paul demonstrated the power of Christ over these evil spirits and expose the content of the evil spirit's message to be full of deceit and fraud. In this act, Paul demonstrated that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. And that's the purpose he came, that's one of the purposes he came, he came down to save us, but in doing so he had to destroy the works of the devil. And this was part and parcel of destroying the works of the devil. Now when people want to uh, go to the fortune tellers, they are now turning their back on what Jesus has said. And they're going to play around, or play with fire, as I deem it, with the mediums and with the fortune tellers, albeit just to, to have a laugh, maybe at a, a city fair or something, you get, uh, you get, uh, the, the fortune teller, um, what, what is it? Uh, you just rolls the fortune teller or whatever it is. I can't, I can't remember how to describe it. But people go into the into the um, the, uh, the tent and they want to oh, come on. They're usually uh, girls or fellas, come on, let's have a laugh. Let's go in there. And then they go in and they say things that they are shocked with. They say things they're shocked at. How does she know that? And, and they're, they're, they see they're on the hook now. And there's where the danger lies. They shouldn't have gone in in the first place. It's not a bit of fun. This is serious stuff. These fortune tellers will tell you it's serious stuff. And those who are their masters and making profit out of them will tell them, this is serious stuff. I'm earning my living by this. And I don't want you to interfere with it, for sure. So, uh, I say we play with fire by going to fortune tellers, and I think we'd be best off not doing it. Okay, another form of this is a medium. A medium is a person claiming the power to communicate with the dead. Uh, a seance is a meeting at which spiritists attempt to contact the dead. And there's, there's lots of seances go on. Um, they're not making it more public now today. They're keeping it under wraps. But uh, they get a lot of people to go along there, especially people who have had husbands or wives or children to die, and they want to, they want to make contact, and they want to know that they're all right. And, uh, and of course, you get the usual thing. Yes, I'm going down this tunnel of light, and I see the spirit arising, and it's telling me, your child is doing fine. 
But they didn't need to go to a medium to know that. If a child dies, that child hasn't committed any sin. That child will be acceptable to God. And that child will get greater chance than maybe we would of having eternal life with Christ. So we don't need these mediums. But uh, a clairvoyant, there's, there's, there's a number of them. The, a clairvoyant is one who was supposed to have a faculty of perceiving the future or the unseen. So you can have a clairvoyant in that position. A psychic is one who's regarded as having paranormal powers. All of their practices are forbidden practices. They are forbidden because the devil uses these practices to deflect the minds of the unbelieving away from God. And I, I might say they, he will try to deflect the minds of the believing as well as the unbelieving. But the unbelieving away from God and his word. King Saul, in contradiction to everything he believed, sought out the witch of Ender to get a message from the other side about the, uh, about the outcome of the war which the Philistines were going to have with Israel the next day. Now, at the end of his life, he, he had been, the, the poor uh, witch was afraid because Saul had put to death all the witches in Israel. And she was afraid that uh, he, he, now she would be exposed and talk to them about it. Um, but she found out later on that it was Saul in disguise. But anyway, the point is, he didn't achieve anything except to have the spirit of Samuel tell him, look, I told you what's going to happen in your life. I told you that you were rebellious. I told you that the spirit of God has gone from you. I told you not to live this way in rebellion towards God's will. He was, Saul was stubborn, pig-headed. He was proud. He didn't start off that way, but he, he grew into that persona. And he had a, he had a uh, priest put to death. He was chasing David to kill him, the one that would, had served him so well as a commanding officer and really did love Israel and love Saul. But he turned into a very bad man. And at the end, he goes and sees a medium to find out what's going to happen. He was already told what's going to happen. What was going to happen the next day was the sum total of all of the consequences of his own willful sinning against God and it ended up in disaster. He was going to die the next day. He was going to die the next day. Saul died the next day for his trespasses which he committed against the Lord because of the word of the Lord which he did not keep and also because he asked counsel of a medium making inquiry of it and it did not uh, and did not inquire of the Lord therefore he God killed him now he, God didn't come down and strangle him or you know or break his legs or tear him apart God allowed the natural consequence of sin to take its course he didn't prevent it falling on him he allowed it and in that way he killed him God takes responsibility even for the things that he allows. And I want us to understand that. But God is not afraid to punish sin. He does not allow the guilty to go unpunished. Just in case you think you're getting away with anything. If you're continuing in your sin. If you're continuing in it without repenting. Without even that, acknowledging that you've done anything. You've got to understand you're defying God. You're making a huge mistake. You need to repent of that sin. You need to ask forgiveness of that sin. You need to return to God and do what is right and righteous in God's eyes. Then you're safe. But only then are you safe. If you continue on the wrong path, you will destroy yourself. You really will destroy yourself. It's hard to believe that we would do that, but we will. 
Anyway, there's um, astrologers, or those who prophesy by the stars, those who predict by the new moons. They read signs from the clouds, the new moon, the liver of a sacrificed animal, from throwing bones or arrows, or by reading tea leaves in the bottom of a cup. <laughs> I remember my brother would have friends around, and after they had their cup of tea, they'd, oh, will you, this is kind of, will you read the tea leaves at the bottom of the cup? <laughs> and she'd take it, and she'd start, she, she knew she hadn't got any powers or anything, but they wanted to hear the lie, so she was ready to give it to them, and she'd read it to them. But you see, that's how simple it can be. But the reading the tea leaves in the bottom of the cup, as is, is as dangerous as throwing the bones, um, uh, which happens when, when you have these witch doctors, they'll throw the bones and they'll give you a reading of how those bones are positioned and why uh, these or what these bones are saying to him and then passes on the message to you. So uh, th this is the way it was. There, there is an interesting um, incident in Ezekiel chapter 21 about throwing the arrows Ezekiel chapter 21. Beginning now in verse 21. For the king of Babylon stands at the parting of the way, at the head of the two ways, to use divination. He shakes the arrows, he consults the household idols, he looks at the liver. Into his right hand came the divination Jerusalem. Now, uh, the king of Babylon had made a pact with Israel uh, and a covenant promise to Israel uh, if they would keep his, his word or his commands that he wouldn't touch them again. And the Israelites had made an oath to this king to serve him and to do what is right. God took that oath very seriously. They didn't take it seriously. They broke that oath. And as a result, Nebuchadnezzar is coming down now to take them away. And there's this parting of the ways. And he uses all the divination that he has at his, uh, at his, his disposal. And it says Jerusalem. I, I'm sure he's a little bit shocked because he doesn't really want to go down to Jerusalem. But God had overridden what uh, they were doing and Jerusalem was appointed by God to be the next visited by Nebuchadnezzar to take them away into captivity because of the evil of their deeds and so it was then uh, it looked like a false divination or message in their eyes they had sworn solemn oaths and they certainly had but now they weren't being kept but he brings iniquity to remembrance that they may be seized that was God's doing and see, God is able to override all of these things. We need to understand that he's able to override all of these things because when you're in a society that believes in these things, it's very hard not to be affected by these things. Another form of astrology is telling the future by the signs of the zodiac. Everybody knows about the signs of the zodiac. The popular form of that is reading one's horoscope in newspapers or magazines. And it's just a matter of turning to the back page or near the back page of the, of the newspaper or the magazine and here's the horoscopes. Oh, what will my horoscope say for me today? What's going to happen this week? Oh, very funny. Uh, yeah, I don't really believe that. It plays on your mind. It plays on your mind. Maybe they're right. Maybe you think, oh, I hope they're right. That sounds good for me. But you're playing around. And you need to be careful. This is just another form of uh, the astrologers who God challenged at one stage. You save the people that you've served. Now that disaster is coming upon them, you get up and save them. Because God knew. They had no power to do anything. No power to save them whatsoever. The game was up. You see, astrologers, just like 
the magicians or um, they get things right sometimes not often sometimes for the most part the reading of the omens are only a figment of their own imagination willful thinking and outright lies and that's what we have got to continue to concentrate on but they said that and it came to pass that doesn't prove anything good guess maybe they read it in the newspaper themselves the day before or heard it on the news or in conversation and based on that they made this guess and it happens to work out but that doesn't mean that they're not lawyers and cheats the spirit of divination is an evil spirit full of all deceit and fraud it has no real power and if there is any power that we give to it by believing in it Jesus is greater than the evil spirits of divination greater he always was and always will be greater so in a sense we have nothing to fear okay let's look at the witches the wizards the sorcerers um, and, and these ones uh, are caught up in malicious things uh, they're like the witch doctors there's not it's not to say that they don't do some good things but for the most part they're caught up with things that are malicious uh, for good or for evil all these function uh, by supposedly having dealings with the devil or evil spirits now once you hear the devil's involved or evil spirits are involved that should ring alarm bells for you uh, at a very high decibel in your head and you need to stop yourself and, and start to think about that and take the warning don't get yourself involved in any way shape or form don't involve yourself their sorcery is a work of the flesh in Galatians it tells us that now the deeds of the flesh are evident which are immorality, impurity, sensuality idolatry, sorcery it's a work of the flesh it's not the work of the spirit of God or any spirit except the spirit, the devil himself but uh, it's a work of the flesh it's what we want to do as humans it comes from us the Greek word is pharmakia, from which we derive the word pharmacy or pharmacist, suggesting that mind-altering drug, uh, drugs were used by them to facilitate contact with the spirits. So they drug themselves up. I know I uh, had a chap that I talked to here, and he, he wanted to find God, but he didn't want to find God through the Bible, like I was pointing out to him, which is the Word of God. He wanted to find God through the experience of magic mushrooms. And he got himself high on magic mushrooms. And he says, you see things and you experience things you can't believe, you know, colors and all sorts of other things that, that happen in these experiences. I said, you're never going to find God that way you're going to have to come back to his word to find him and I want you to think about that of course he, he ha ha that and, and moved on and I haven't seen him for years so I don't know what's happened to him but uh, he, he was high on these drugs and people who are involved like witches and wizards and sorcerers they don't mind using drugs to get themselves into a uh, hallucinations or a, a, a hallucinatory state so that they can convince themselves and their clients that they're speaking from uh, spirits that are on the other side not only did they uh, uh, use drugs for themselves they, uh, they used them for the clients as well they give them something to drink and oh, it's spiked and uh, they know how to use these drugs and if you're involved in drinking this stuff you're already hooked you're into it because your mind is not going to be your own in a few minutes when it's taken over by the experience of the drugs and the hallucinations 
And I must say, if what all, they, all these druggies say to me, that, uh, that there's some great pleasure, pleasurable stuff in taking drugs. And I believe them, because it's addictive. Those sorts of practices were used worldwide in ancient times, and I don't doubt are used in the present times as well. There's a very sinister element in their practices in that they curse others by casting spells on them. And there's, uh, there's interesting passage in Ezekiel about these women who were witches and who were uh, casting spells on other people, the clients will come to them, I want this person cursed um, because they're my enemy, I hate them. They've taken everything I've got, they've stolen my children or whatever else. And they would sew armbands to put on the arms and make veils to put on the head. They hunted down these people and had them killed. And they did die. And it created great fear in the society. And God challenges them and says, look, who are you to let people or to kill people who should not have died and to let people live who should not have lived? You let them live for yourself. You're playing God here. I'm against you for this. I'm going to hold you to account and I'm going to take away your powers and destroy your practices. So here it was now that God was facing up to these people and telling them they're absolutely wrong in what they're doing. You see, they, they prey on superstition. Superstition is to have an, an, an irrational fear of the unknown or the mysterious. Superstition can be a practice, a belief, or a religion, all based on this irrational fear. What are you afraid of? I don't know, but I'm afraid. That's, that's about the size of it. Uh, now, again, when I was younger, there was a lot of superstition in Ireland. A lot of superstition. That's why we could believe in fairies. <clears throat> and there'll be people, even in our society today, who will get on to me and, and say that fairies are real. <coughs> So you shouldn't be speaking against them. Bad luck will come to you. You see, that's, that's the type of thing that happened. If, uh, if, you, if you broke a mirror, it was seven years bad luck. And as a kid, <laughs> you, you break the mirror, you know. Accidentally, you break the mirror. And then they're telling you, Seven years bad luck for this family. We're never going to get out of it. This is terrible. The shot only broke a mirror. You can replace this, the mirror. But that's, that was the fear that they instilled in you. You can't walk under a ladder. Uh, if you see a black cat at the beginning of your day, you know you're going to have a bad day. If you see a magpie, you better start looking for the second magpie because if you don't find the second magpie, you're in real trouble. Uh, and all this sort of stuff was going on and people were frightened. They were genuinely frightened. Of course, they, the ignorance played into it as well, but they were genuinely frightened. And for me, what it says is, say this, permeates throughout the whole society. And, and, and this, is, uh, this is what happened. Um, the, these people were purveyors of all sorts of fears and all types of uh, evil. The devil used idolatry and the occult to create fear among the peoples of the world. I'm quoting now from uh, a fellow called Heschel. He, he uh, produced a book called The Prophets. And he was talking about the, the gods of the Gentiles, the pagans. He says, in Homer, gods as well as men are indifferent to crimes committed against others than themselves. At times, the gods force men to commit crime 
What man thinks of the character of all gods is bluntly expressed. Father Zeus, their supreme god, of all gods you are the most malicious. Just imagine thinking our god is the most malicious person who has power and control over us. They believed that Zeus was malicious and that he didn't care about humans, that he would hurt humans, he would destroy their lives. He had no conscience about it whatsoever, no feeling of sorrow, no compassion, nothing. Uh, this is what he's, uh, he's writing about them. Um, he's, he's exposing what they feel about it. Um, let's see, where am I? Uh, Father Zeus, uh, of all gods, you are the most malicious. You have no pity on men, though you have given them birth. You lead them into misery and wretched pains. It is Zeus who sends weal and woe upon mankind according to his own good pleasure. I've heard this before. According to his own good pleasure. God decided before the world began, according to his own good pleasure, to save some and to destroy the rest. Now that was Zeus you're talking about, not our God, not the God of the Bible. But Calvinists believe that. And I wondered where they ever got it from. Here's where they got it from. It's an old pagan belief. It's an old pagan belief that's been polished up now to look like a Christian belief. But it's no, it's no, does it, it shines, it doesn't shine bright for me at all, either in Christian form or in pagan form. This is the lot gods have spun for miserable men that they should live in pain, yet they themselves are sorrowless. Now, when you have gods of this caliper who are doing these things, and then you had the combination of this idolatry and sorcery combined, and it created in the nations of the world a toxic atmosphere of superstition. We can't believe what Christianity has done for us over the centuries, of the fog that has been lifted, of the irrational fear that has been lifted, of the ignorance that has been lifted from societies all over the world. We live in relative freedom because people believed the gospel and believed that God was a good God and believed in his word and took him at his word. The idolatry and the sorcery combined creating in the nations of the world a toxic atmosphere of superstition and ordinary people lived in constant dread of their pagan gods and of the paranormal powers. Can you imagine going to bed with that fear at night, waking up with that fear in the morning, living through the day with that fear in your heart? They waited with bated breath every day of their lives for something to happen to them out of the blue. Paralyzed by the unknown, they became more and more anxious, leading many into mental health problems like paranoia, etc. I want to ask you, is this our future? People are turning away from God wholesale in this country. I can't believe what we were when I came back in 1975 to preach the gospel for us, how things have changed. There was, a, there was a standard, there was a morality, there was a commitment to religion, maybe not the right religion, but there was a commitment. It's all gone. They've given in to every vice and every sin. They're walking in the way of right, unrighteousness here. We're in a bad way, this society. And I ask myself, is this the future for us? Our warning is, brethren, do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. And now that, that whole thing in, in uh, Galatians chapter 5, it, it makes it very special to me that he's saying the yoke of slavery wasn't just the law of Moses. It was the occult. It was the idolatry. It was the immorality that was going on. We are freed from all of that. We're free. Free. Free to do what is right, not to do what you want. Free to do what is right in the eyes of God, to please God, to walk in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus Christ, to adhere 
to be answerable to nobody but God to, eternal, to uh, obtain eternal salvation and to look for the good in everything in this life because the one who is running it is God and he's a good God. It was for freedom Christ set you free. Therefore keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery, he tells us in Galatians 5 verse 1. The secret things, brethren, belong to the Lord our God. And he's every right to them. Don't forget, he has all knowledge. All the knowledge there is resides in him. All the understanding there is resides in him. All the wisdom there is resides in him. He's infinitely wise and understanding and knowledgeable. We just need to turn to him in prayer. If we've got a, a request, if we're in difficulty, if we're, if we're really being harassed, if our lives are threatened, go to God. He can do something about it for you. Ask in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. He will listen to that prayer for you. He will answer that prayer for you. He's the spirit who knows all things, who understands all things, who is wise beyond measure don't play around with the evil spirits or the mediums or the occult in any way shape or form they have nothing to offer us except darkness and lies and they will bring us back into the slavery that this, this society was once in so that's the lesson for today I hope that's been interesting for you and I hope it sounded out a warning for you. Maybe it gives you a better insight to the occult and the idolatry and the condition of the world that was in in ancient times and how things have changed for us and how blessed we are and how we should be giving thanks every day that we're Christians and that we walk in the light and that we're slaves to no one but Christ Jesus our Lord. I'll leave it there with you. Thank you for listening.